it's dangerous territory. I know. You make enemies talking about this stuff. Certainly. You know, it's so sad. And our goal was to understand how fish oils, rich in long chain omega-3 fatty acids, could inhibit skin cancer in a mouse model for skin cancer. Hmm. And when we were doing this work, we found through various different um, tweaks to the mouse model that omega-3 fatty acids did nothing to inhibit skin carcinogenesis. I didn't know that was how it all began. Um, so as you kind of alluded to, it was against your hypothesis that the omega-6s would be protective in the skin cancer model. Um, and so I guess, where did that hypothesis come from? Why are omega-6s thought to be detrimental to health from the get-go? Well, to dig a little deeper into what we found, we learned that omega-6 linoleic acid is an essential component of uh, the waxy layer of your skin to maintain hydration. Mm -hmm. which again, if, if we all go back to our basic nutrition 101 class, one of the key um, clinical uh, manifestations of essential fatty acid deficiency is scaly skin, dehydration, et cetera. We realized that there's a lot of steps that we were assuming would just happen automatically that don't happen automatically in the skin. And now we've learned probably that is true all over the body. We now know linoleic acid itself is a precursor for oxylipins, lipoxygenase products that are also often anti-inflammatory. Hmm. And, and to add a little more to the complexity and what, what has evolved, I think in the science overall is we now understand even that pro-inflammation prostaglandins and leukotrienes are needed so that you can then reach resolution of that inflammation. So mm -hmm. all of these compounds that we're talking about, whether they're from linoleic acid or arachidonic acid or long chain omega-3 fatty acids are short-lived molecules mm -hmm. that give a punch to inflammation and perhaps other events, but then that are res resolved through some of these other oxylipins that are produced from the same fatty acids. So it's very complicated. And the simple idea that we had in, in 1990 is now, I think, evolved to something a little more complex and typically so in biology. If we kind of look more at the dietary side of things and um, omega-6 linoleic being a part of soybean oil, um, a large part of the American fats that we, or maybe used to be um, American fat that we intake. Can you talk a little bit about how much omega-6 is in the diet, where it's coming from, what's changed over the last few years, kind of that whole story? Yeah. Um, one of the things I often will see is this assumption that um, because vegetable oils have increased in prominence in the diets of many people in the United States, that that increase in vegetable oils, which can be rich in linoleic acid, correlates to an increase in obesity and diseases. Mm -hmm. But what's often forgotten is there's a lot of other things that have changed in our food supply mm -hmm. over the last 50 to 100 years. Right. Um, in fact, what we now are seeing is many vegetable oils that were rich in linoleic acid, like soybean, canola, sunflower seed oils, those are changing to be high, uh, well, I'll say high oleic acid and low linoleic acid. Mm -hmm. So again, we're really interested in that linoleic acid. And these oils are changing um, due to plant breeding, um, which is old fashioned genetic modification, right? Mm -hmm. um, for different reasons, not to get rid of linoleic acid, but really to increase this monounsaturated fat that doesn't oxidize as quickly mm -hmm. when the oil is stored or when it's processed to make things like trans, I'm um, sorry, hydrogenated fats, which can produce trans fats. So mm -hmm. it's not being changed. I mean, obviously, the scientists who are doing these genetic um, breeding experiments mm -hmm. are not doing it for the health reasons. They're doing it for stability of the oil. Mostly for stability, but it does, this is, yeah, I know too much about oils, so and, and nobody really cares, but when you hydrogenate these oils, so you hydrogenate a high oleic acid oil, you have half the amount of double bonds that you have to saturate to make that oil into a solid at room temperature. Mm -hmm. So with half the amount of double bonds, you basically have half the amount of chances of trans fats forming. And mm -hmm. these synthetically produced trans fats are not good for us. We, we know that. And those are fatty acids that are not 
we don't need them, we don't want them. And in fact, at low levels, they're very harmful for heart health. And Dr. Harris, you know that more than anybody because of all of the work you've done with heart disease over the years, which is yeah. your work is some of the seminal work in this area and in fatty acid area. So, yeah. so th that's really, I think, why the oils have changed is to um, address the need that the that many food companies have to make a saturated fat product that they can put in a lot of their foods. It's very stable. Mm -hmm. It forms a matrix for their food products that they desire. It's great mouth quality. And yes, it doesn't oxidize as quickly. Of course, and, it doesn't, and it's low in trans fats. It's below and one gram per serving or something, right? Exactly. So it's, it's yeah, getting it's, a lot of goals in one, one product. What's interesting to me is that there's a fair amount of evidence that higher levels of blood levels of monounsaturates are not associated with good outcomes. No, yeah, in another. fact, in fact, oh. over a third of our fat calories is monounsaturated fat, and it's mostly oleic acid, which is probably not harmful. And and I think there's more, there there are not a lot of data to show it's it's protective, but I don't see a lot of data that show high oleic acid in your blood is harmful. It's just kind of a neutral fatty acid, whereas mm -hmm. as many many studies have shown from around the world, not just in the United States, that higher linoleic acid, and of course, higher omega-3, long-chain omega-3 fatty acids like the omega-3 index are very much associated with protection against heart disease. Um, we know with linoleic acid, it's highly associated with reduced risk for type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. and reduced risk for, a lot of studies are now showing reduced risk for um, uh, weight gain in the trunk region, which we call central obesity as well as um, it's- oh, Yeah, elaborate on that because we we hear, you know, again, one of the urban myths is that omega-6 causes body weight gain. So both correlative studies and actually some causal studies have shown now that higher levels of linoleic acid or linoleic acid oil supplementation reduce fat in the trunk region of a person mm -hmm. and reduce visceral fat. Mm -hmm. And these are very rigorous randomized controlled trials almost always blind, and mm -hmm. some are even crossover studies that have shown this. Um, our lab was one that showed the trunk fat reduction, hmm. but a few groups out of the Scandinavian countries have shown the reduction of adipose from the visceral uh, measurement using magnetic resonance imaging. Mm -hmm. and, Does it just, just redistribute or is there just less, uh, is body weight down, total fat? Down? You know, it, it's not clear. Visceral fat it is reduced. So it's absolutely adipose tissue. It's not just maybe fat in the liver, but some of those same groups have also shown reduced non-alcoholic fatty liver disease risk mm -hmm. and reduction of fat in the liver when you measure it in people who have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So do, do vegetable oils have a lot of oxidized fatty acids in them? Oxidized. Well, um, yeah, good question. So if they do, you shouldn't eat them, but you would smell it and taste it just like with any fatty acid and including long chain omega-3 fatty acids, if they start oxidizing, you get that taste and that smell that we often associate with fishiness. Mm -hmm. It's not the fish that are smelly, it's the oxidation of those oils, which would be that telling you the oils aren't fresh, they haven't been stored well, and you shouldn't consume them. And that's true for any oil, whether it's an omega-3 fatty acid oil or omega-6 fatty acid rich oil, or even monounsaturated. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oil. yeah, anything but like good stinky cheese, if it stinks, you want to stay away from it. Well. Cheese? Are you kidding? Stinky cheese is good. Well, there's certain cheeses that are stinky <laughs> and they're on purpose stinky. I know. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. Uh, um, that's that's great. That's I think just really helps clarify um, some of the confusion around oxidation, lipids, um, these oils, what's going on in our food systems, um, and why, which is very helpful. Um, kind of related to what we were talking about before with blood levels, how does dietary intake of linoleic correspond to blood levels of linoleic acid? What's it affecting the blood level? Yeah, so one would think that because linoleic acid is one of only two required fatty acids, so your body can't make it, that if you eat a certain level, you'd see a certain level in your blood because your body can't make it. So the only level that's in your blood is from your diet. But we also know that what's in the blood turns over and becomes other things. It goes on to form all these enzymatic oxidized products, which are good. They act as signaling molecules. They can act to um, bind to receptors to cause different things to happen in cells. 
And so because of that, the blood level and the diet level are not that strongly coordinated, correlated. They mm -hmm. are significant, but when I talk to people who are used to high levels of correlation, they look at it and they go, really, you think that's good? And I say, yes, in the diet field, we think that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. So you can use blood levels as a um, marker for dietary intake. And we, in fact, do. We just know that there's some variability with that blood level. There's different things in each of us that affect our levels of linoleic acid beyond our diet. Yeah. So inputs, diet, but output could be oxidation products or being uh, elongated and desaturated to longer chain fatty acids and any other things. Well, it's um, stored in the adipose tissue too. Just, or, yeah. It gets... Yeah, maybe being picked up by different tissues and, and uh, right. that's true. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you. So, right. so if you're stuck in an elevator with a uh, person who's got an honest question about omega-6, they've, they've heard that they're bad for you and they really want to know before you get to the 10th floor, what do you think? I mean, what's your... You got an elevator speech for omega-6? My elevator speech is, the good news is I think we have to rethink that, that um, assumption that linoleic acid is bad for us. Mm -hmm. And we are rethinking it because of the newest evidence within the past 20 years, but every year we see more and more accumulating evidence that linoleic acid could be actually good for us. And we think it is good for us for not only fulfilling needs for requirements because it is an, an essential nutrient in our diet, but we think it has some of these other health benefits. And in fact, for over 70 years, we've known it is associated with protection for heart disease. Mm -hmm. um, and the American Heart Association has published quite a few papers to remind practitioners and scientists that this has been pretty well documented time and time and time again. Yeah, but our ancestors, you know, you know what they ate, you know, that that one-to-one -one, omega-6 to omega-3, and, you know, they were really, really healthy. They didn't have heart disease or cancer. I, so, I Right. So I never knew a dietitian was taking their dietary intakes back a gazillion years ago. <laughs> and of course, I do wonder how, you know, when you died at the age of 22 or maybe 35, mm -hmm. how that could be. Um, affecting some of those data, but I, I don't, I try not to get into those weeds, Dr. Harris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't follow me in. Dog no, me. no. That's great. Good. Good work. It's a, yeah. Um, I have two kind of specific questions. Um, and one is around, I guess I'll start with this linoleic acid and insulin resistance. And you're seeing this correlation and, um, I read somewhere that insulin increases the activity of the delta, the delta six desaturase that's after. Mm -hmm. Is have, is that, and that could be one of the reasons why a higher linoleic acid level is associated with um, better insulin activity, essentially. Is that something you've heard, learned about, thought about? Actually, that, that um, I would look at it almost in the opposite way, that if your linoleic acid is improving insulin sensitivity, your body doesn't have to pump out as much insulin. So your insulin levels start to go down in your body. That's what insulin resistance does. And so a surrogate way to measure insulin resistance, first of all, you could look at glucose disappearance after you give some insulin, and that's done with a clamp if you really want to measure it with really good sensitivity. The other way is you could look at fasting insulin levels and fasting mm -hmm. insulin levels can tell us if someone's insulin resistant, because as you become more insulin resistant, before you become a person with type two diabetes, your pancreas is working harder and harder to increase your insulin to get mm -hmm. all that glucose out of your blood. So mm -hmm. we kind of look at it as if, well, linoleic acid could be improving insulin sensitivity that allows for your insulin levels to start to come down which then might be the reason we see this lower visceral fat, lower lipogenesis in some of these tissues. So, so I kind of look at it that way. And okay. I, we don't know which is which, but I think I'm thinking linoleic acid is something causative to do with improving insulin sensitivity. Would you, and, is there a relationship between blood linoleic acid levels and fasting insulin? There is. So the linoleic acid is acting on the exterior, like the muscle and the liver and adipose tissue and making those more able, able to pick up, act on insulin or pick or take glucose out of the bloodstream. Is that the idea? Yeah. Yep, that's right. That's very cool. Um, yeah. I like that. Uh, the other question I had was kind of around 
some of the things that uh, people are worried about with high linoleic and the diet and worried that it will slow down the omega-3 pathway. I think that's where that um, omega-6, omega-3 ratio is not really where we want to be going with our messaging for both scientists and clinicians. And of course, I guess then a third thing is for the public. I think that's very misleading that we want to increase our linoleic or decrease our linoleic acid to, to form a better amount of uh, long chain omega-3s. I think we want both in our diets. Yeah. And I certainly think with our, our food supply, we can get both in, in good, healthy levels. Mm -hmm. Great. That sounds yeah. like a nice concluding statement. I like that. Yeah.